Good morning, everyone, or good evening, wherever you may be. Um, my name's Kelvin Hill. Um, we've just um, gone over to 11 a.m. Sydney, Melbourne time, or 10.30 Central Australian time. I just want to welcome everyone to this um, last of our webinar series, um, which we'll be discussing the uh, Australian Living Evidence Consortium Living Guidelines Handbook, um, which has been a, a great resource development a few years coming so it's um, fantastic to have you all uh, listening in can i um give uh official welcome and, and thanks to saskia and david for presenting um this morning i'll, I'll give a bit of a, a more formal introduction um but from our point of view i'm the chair of the australian and new zealand um guidelines international network group um, it's a pleasure to have you on um, on the line. Um, so this webinar, if you can just make sure that you mute yourselves, so we, we, it's actually um, you're not actually in just living listening only mode. It's a, it's a full um, webinar mode. So please mute yourself. Um, but please uh, interact, put in your questions or comments in the chat. Um, let's have as much engagement as we can because that's how we all learn from each other. Um, the recording will be available um, later on the, the GIN YouTube channel. Um, but importantly, we, we love feedback about these webinars um, and we uh, certainly take on board what people view as, as really um, beneficial for you as the, as the network. So please email us any feedback um, that you have uh, for this webinar and also any future ideas or suggestions. Um, Firstly, we just want to pause and recognise country. For me, it's the Awabakal people here just out of Newcastle, um, but we certainly respect our heritage and, and the, the long history um, and traditions that, that we um, are gifted and certainly pay our respects to the elders past and present. And hopefully we can encapsulate that, that essence of um, sustainability and learning from each other and, and um, uh, being in tune with with uh, our resources and making the most of that. Social media, just as a last plug, if you are a, a, a tweeter, um, please um, tweet. Um, that would be great. We like sharing that. I'm, I have no idea about it, but if you are, fantastic. Um, so please do that. Here's the, here's the hashtag. And um, to our two speakers. So, um, Thanks very much for, for agreeing to, to join. So David uh, Fael Navarro is a research fellow at Cochrane Australia. Um, he's done some fantastic work uh, on methods and methodology. Uh, he, he's actively involved with health informatics and automation of, prim um, of primary care health records. So it's a really interesting field. Uh, David's a trained GP and worked clinically in Spain and in the UK. So it's great to have you on board. Thanks for uh, presenting this morning. And secondly, for Saskia um, Chain, is a research fellow also working with Cochrane Australia uh, around methods, has a lot of experience in, in a vast range of different methods over, the, over about a decade, um, and certainly has a passion in, in improving the healthcare through evidence-based practice. So I just want to welcome and thank both of our speakers and I'll hand over to them. We will have a good amount of question time at the end. So please think about really challenging questions for these guys. It's nice to uh, um, challenge them, but uh, over to you guys and thank you again. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, I will start sharing my screen. Um, All right, thanks everyone this week. Thanks everyone for coming. And, and yeah, uh, we are very proud to be presenting today our recently published Living Guidelines Handbook, which was published in the first version, at least on October. And it comes from the collective work and experiences of our ALEC Living Guidelines. Uh, with uh, a lot of experts and contributing from our methods and working methods and process working group. 
Uh, and yeah, that's that's about it. If you haven't seen the handbook or you don't have a copy of it, please go to our website where you can just click and download it and it's all yours for, for use and share. So I will begin by, well, my colleague Saskia will begin by introducing who is Alec on what are our living guidelines. Uh, then uh, what was the motivation behind this handbook, why we created it. Uh, a brief description of what are living guidelines. Uh, then we will give an overview of the handbook, the structure and, and key, key elements. Uh, then we will dive a bit more into some specific chapters that we consider as part of the core methods for living guidelines. Uh, a short summary, and then we hope a, a big uh, amount of questions for, for you to and ask anything you want about living. So, uh, yeah. Um, Thanks, David. Um, so just to introduce the Australian Living Evidence Consortium, or ALEC, as it's known, um, this was launched in 2018 with what Kelvin has been working on, which was the world's first living guidelines for stroke. And later living guidelines have been focused on diabetes, kidney disease, COVID-19 and musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, so you can see we have a large number of groups that have now joined us and recently had uh, Cancer Council also join the consortium. We have a living evidence methods and processes working group, mm -hmm. which was the um, who published uh, this handbook. So that's a large collection of people from all of the different guideline uh, groups, uh, all developing living guidelines who contributed to this handbook, as well as a program of work that we have in kind of really investigating uh, living evidence methods and specifically living evidence guidelines. So back to you, David. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. It's not working now. Uh, okay, so first of all, why living? Why are we into this uh, endeavor, into this um, space of living guidelines, living evidence? Uh, back, back in the day, uh, a few years ago already, that is from 2015, Julian Elliott and colleagues uh, already highlighted that, uh, that there is weak knowledge in the knowledge systems and clinicians and consumer are particularly vulnerable to lowest opinions and low value care. And that reflects very much into how guidelines are not usually updated very frequently and how that uh, ends up having this sort of uh, space for these lowest opinions and not evidence informed decisions arising. So, uh, uh, another recent paper, uh, we have seen this before in many areas of chronic diseases, but it even became more, more evident during, during this pandemic. And, and since we have this sort of, um, yeah, this sort of tsunami of papers of uh, different expert opinions, different treatment protocols, and to tackle all of this, uh, it, it was it was evident that uh, traditional guidelines model was was not was not possible nor desirable to to manage all of this. So this is where it comes the living evidence model uh, in a conventional guideline update model. Uh, a guideline is developed uh, usually one year. That would be I would say. Um, very optimistic, but a year of development, and then the guideline is published, then it becomes outdated, more and more outdated, until af after a few years, usually three, five years, without any updates, then you have to start climbing again this mountain of, of reviewing again all this evidence, publish an update, and then becoming outdated uh, for a few years. Uh, the living evidence model instead, what it does, it, uh, we have to climb this initial mountain of evidence. But once you are there, instead of uh, stopping and not updating for a number of, of years, you keep uh, a process of continual evidence surveillance. And that is what allows the guideline to be up to date and to be maintained over time 
without having to climb this sort of mountain once again every, every few years. So as Saskia was saying before, uh, ALEC Living Guidelines, we have been the pioneers in a way on, on living guidelines on, on across the world uh, with the stroke guideline, uh, Kelvin is leading uh, the first living guideline, and also with the COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force. And this graphic here that I like very much, it just shows how, how it, how long it took for changes or new evidence to be incorporated into updates, into updates before the living guideline model was established, and how these updated updates and reviews of evidence are much more frequent now. In the case of stroke, uh, in the case of COVID, uh, even more drastic that we have since the study was published into the recommendation was was released or, or published in the guideline, it took only a few days, which is a massive change from, from the previous models. Uh, this is not only us. Uh, international organizations are all very keen and exploding living evidence and living guidelines models from the WHO to NICE in the UK, several American organizations, and yeah, uh, it's in this context and in this light that we thought, oh, we, we need a handle. We need something to, to guide us, to, to provide some sort of, uh, to condense our experience and, and provide developers uh, in-house and beyond uh, on, on a, a little guidance uh, on, on how to develop living guidelines. Um, so this, this is our main motivation, provide clarity, definitions, and, and create a, a practical document more, more than anything. And as everything here is, is living, uh, we also consider that this handbook is, is a living document. It, this is just the first release version, but we expect to have refinements and, and further versions we have a bunch of ideas for chapters for for expansion so yeah I, I think that's that's the way to go also for for this for this guideline for this guidance is to be updated and and to keep refining and improving it over time so now i'm going to launch a, a little zoom pool if i manage to do it uh just to get your what do you expect from these sessions or what are your interest in, in living? So this should be launched now. I will leave it there for a, for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, uh, just to figure it out what, what you expect and what, why is your, that you are interested in living? Could be living guidelines, could be living systematic reviews. Uh, we do have yeah, uh, a bit of an overlap with living systematic review methods uh, because basically a, a living guideline will be relying on living systematic reviews to, to update its recommendations, but we do have also some, some specificities that go beyond what a living systematic review is. So we will try not to cover both, but to point in, you into the direction of living systematic reviews, and then um, more into the specifics of living guidelines. Okay, so I left the poll for one minute now, and I will end it. So it seems that, uh, yeah, there's a general interest in living methods for half of you. Uh, understand what makes living guideline living. I think that's, that's a key issue and a key concept that we will try to cover because uh, people these days are not here, but internationally calling many things living. And we need also some, some clarification on what makes living living and not all the things that are called living are equally living. So we will try to cover a bit of that. Um, and I think that some people also want to know uh, or they are involved in living systematic reviews and living guidelines or how to get started. So yeah, we will try to cover a, a bit of those. And moving next, 
uh, yeah, that's one of the key things that we developed for this guide, for this handbook is to create a definition of living guidelines. So the way that we define living guidelines, a living guideline is an evidence-based guideline that comprises one or more living recommendations that are continually updated as new information becomes available. Living guidelines also identify and provide a justification for which recommendations are living or static and includes a rationale for the plan updating frequency. So this is our main definition. And as you can see, uh, the key element here is that, first of all, the, the unit of, of update uh, or the unit of, of living is the recommendation, it's not the guideline. Uh, a living guideline, I, in, in an ideal world, would have all recommendations living, but we are aware that not all recommendations need to be living. Uh, that could be a very burden and, and resource intense process. So a living guideline will have at least one or more living recommendations. And then it could have also some parts of the guideline that are not living, that are just maintained and updated in a more, in a more traditional basis. Uh, and then the key, the key concept here is this continual process of update. And that is that to appraise, to review, to search, and incorporate newer information as soon as it becomes available. Also, the second part of our definition is that uh, living guidelines need to provide a justification and clarity uh, on why some recommendations are living, why some of them are aesthetic, and what is the rationale and the planet updated frequency. That, mm. that will resume the, the key elements to, to define what a living guideline is and what a living recommendation is. Um, yeah, I, I think we, I cover most of this, uh, just, this is for now, uh, an ALEC document. This is not set in stone, but we are considering for our living guidelines that we need to establish some sort of cutoff points because, uh, uh, as I said, we have seen internationally that some people say, oh, I created a living guideline and then, <laughs> You check uh, and they haven't updated anything in nine months, 12 months. So you start to wonder if they are really living or they are not really living. So as a matter of line in the sun, what we are saying here is that the evidence search uh, should be at least conducted once every three months. And uh, considering and publishing updated recommendations should be once every six months. That could mean that if you have an, you could update much sooner, uh, but at least every three months a search should be run and you should update your guideline, update your, uh, your evidence base once every six months. That could mean that you haven't done any change in your recommendations. That could be perfectly normal if, the evidence that you have collected uh, goes in the same direction or is not enough to change a specific recommendation. You can have the same, the same recommendations, but at least uh, you need to reflect that the evidence base has been updated when it has been updated and, and stated clearly into your guide. Um, so from here, I will... I will let Saskia speak uh, and go a bit more about some overview of the details of the guideline. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm just gonna go a little bit over um, some of the elements that we cover as part of the Living Guidelines Handbook. So this is what we're calling the spinning wheel of living. Uh, so the first, uh, let me just, yeah. um, so firstly, you need to decide, as David mentioned before, there's a lot of guidelines that, you know, perhaps they don't actually need to be living. Um, you know, not everything has to be living, but they certainly are appropriate in areas with high priority, with uncertainty or clinical controversy. 
and a likelihood that new evidence is going to emerge. So once you've decided that your guidelines should be living, you can then establish governance structures, which can also be revised over time, which is a key difference between static guidelines and living guidelines. So you need a team culture that enables adaptive, dynamic and responsive work. And you have changing conflicts of interest over time. So you need processes to manage that. And you also need inbuilt structures to account for member turnover. You can then move on to defining your scope. And again, a key difference is, is that your scope can be revised or expanded um, over time. Um, you then can move on to prioritising of clinical questions. And this is something that we'll go into a bit more detail about later in the presentation. Um, but you can prioritise these to varying intensities of living mode. Um, they can be revised again throughout the process. So you might have something that was a high priority at the start, but now you've actually got a high certainty of evidence. Um, so it's, and you've made a strong recommendation for that. So it might no longer need to be living. So you can revise that throughout the process. And you also importantly have the opportunity to add new questions. So you have a constant monitoring of the evidence, which may trigger new questions. Um, so then you identify this new evidence. So you conduct evidence searches. Um, as David said before, this is at least once every three months. So for COVID, we, we've been searching daily, um, but obviously it could be um, in every three months or weekly or fortnightly or whatever is appropriate for the question that you're looking at. Um, you then uh, can use technologies. So we use technologies like Covidence and Magic App, which um, have features that enable living guidelines. So then you can move to in the incorporation of new evidence. So the new evidence can include systematic reviews, um, RCTs, um, observational studies, um, if the evidence is expected um, to change the recommendation. So if you kind of have a trigger for that evidence um, that that's going to have a change on the current recommendations that are in living mode within your guideline. Um, and you can uh, pre-specify um, decision thresholds for when you it's appropriate to incorporate that new evidence. So that's, again, a key part of the living process. So an, another key element of living, as opposed to uh, the more traditional guideline model, is that the unit of update is the individual recommendation. And there is no need to wait for the whole guideline to be revised. So you could have a whole guideline that most of the recommendations only need to really be looked at at that traditional sort of two to five year mark, potentially. Um, or And you might just have one question within that that's really high priority for living. And that question is kept in living mode. So that recommendation is kept living. So um, then you have the approval and endorsement process, which again is different because it's at multiple time points, um, which obviously, you know, coordination with external approvals um, and processes, but also that you might, instead of having the whole guideline come um, as something that needs to be approved and endorsed, you might have just the one individual recommendation that needs to be endorsed. Um, so that also creates, you can, you can then look at, you know, who is particularly of uh, concern to uh, go out to um, and is part of sort of stakeholders within that particular recommendation. So there's some flexibility there as well that the living model provides. Um, and then you move on to the publication and dissemination. Again, a key difference because it occurs at multiple time points. So every time you have a new or updated recommendation, and we're also saying that at least every three months, you should really be providing some form of update, whether that's we search for evidence for this question, um, this recommendation remains unchanged, um, and there, but you know we are sort of doing that continual living process in the background. So it's about making our guideline users aware of what you're doing in your living processes, when your last search was, and whether that last search did identify any new evidence that would trigger an update. And then um, finally, there's the transition out of living mode. So this is really going back to the key priority criteria you looked at at the start of what exactly is living. So you might have something that's actually no longer a priority. Um, maybe no uncertainty remains, so you now have a strong use or do not use recommendations, so you no longer need to be looking, um, new evidence isn't going to change what your recommendation is. 
Um, or perhaps there's no new evidence anticipated, um, particularly if you have a question that perhaps the study design um, can't be conducted um, to, to really answer that question. Um, you might not be expecting any new evidence or um, you, there, there may be no new evidence because there is certainty now um, in the evidence base. So that is our uh, summary of our spinning wheel of living and um, the different stages um, of living processes. So I'll hand back to you, David. Thank you, Saskia. Um, okay, so after this overview, I will go a bit more into the handbook document itself, uh, just to help you navigate it and speak a bit of more of the chapters and the structure, and then we go into some specific chapters. So this is the handbook document. For now, it's a, it's a PDF uh, document that you can find online. Uh, okay. so, so here is the, the, the index, the list of chapters. So what we have covered is introduction, what are living guidelines, give some definitions and the principles of living. Uh, then chapter three is uh, when to consider a living guideline. And as Saskia was saying, uh, you can follow process of decision to see if your recommendations are a high priority for decision making. Uh, new evidence is likely to change these recommendations. And of course, if new evidence is expected to emerge. Uh, uh, this chapter helps you um, think and, and consider if, if your guideline is appropriate for living or your specific clinical question is or not. Then we have a chapter on question prioritization. That Saskia will go more deeply in just a minute. Then we have chapter uh, decisions surrounding living systematic review processes. And this is uh, I will go a bit more deep as well, basically trying to decide what approach are you going to follow for, for your living guideline and the living systematic review process that is behind a living guideline. Uh, a chapter on search, which explains a bit not how to conduct uh, systematic review searches, but what is the overall approach that you will take on, on your living guideline project. Uh, on search, uh, and we identify two overarching approaches that I will go a bit more in detail. Uh, how to approach evidence appraisal and synthesis. And as Saskia was saying, you might want to consider some triggers uh, to, uh, to, to appraise, to, sorry, to, to incorporate evidence. Uh, also, you might want to do some modified approaches to make them to appraisal, to make them more swift uh, with the appearance of the preprints in the medical domain. We also might want to consider new sources of data uh, be beyond uh, published uh, data. And also sometimes could be uh, registry, clinical trial registry data, regulatory data, Developing and updating recommendations, uh, how you update, how frequent you update, and when to incorporate new evidence. As I was talking of triggers, you can also have triggers here. Then there is a whole chapter of our experiences on consumer engagement. Uh, we will go deep into this, but Annie Sinod has done a great job on, on this area, the task force, and also beyond. Uh, appro approval, publication, and dissemination of living guidelines. Uh, although this is fairly specific to organizations, we reflect a bit on, on our process and how we manage to do this in a swift way, because sometimes you could review the evidence very quickly and have everything ready, but then it's stuck into the approval processes. Uh, then we have a maintenance phase, which covers more uh, what do you do when you have climbed this initial mountain and also how you revise topic, deprioritize, or also in the case that you are uh, 
thinking of transitioning a uh, living guideline or some living questions out of living mode. So that's the basic structure of the handbook. Uh, and now I will go back to Saskia, which go, will go a bit deeper into the prioritization chapter. Thanks, David. Yeah, so um, as David mentioned before, uh, there is a section in the handbook around prioritization. And Sorry, I don't know if I just dropped out there for a second. I'll start again. <laughs> um, so we looked at prioritization of guidance. Um, I'm so sorry, Zaskia. Do you mind just putting your slides back on? Oh, they've, they've gone out, have they? Okay. Yes. Sure. Okay. Okay, um, so as, uh, yeah, as David was mentioning before, uh, there is a chapter in the handbook that looks at prioritization and prioritization of recommendations and clinical questions. Uh, so what we uh, looked at was identifying questions firstly, then selecting questions, and then going through this process of prioritizing and re revising. So throughout the living mode, you can continually revise what the priority level is of the selected question for living mode and then the retirement of questions from living mode. So firstly, can, when you're looking at identifying questions, you might look at things like engagement directly with decision makers. You then might also look at other factors like monitoring regulatory, political and other clinical and contextual factors. Also getting feedback from the public to suggest questions. So for example, in the COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force, we have um, a specific section on the website where you can go and you can put your clinical question that you'd like answered, and we will consider that um, as part of the panels. So um, then you can look obviously at the evidence. So if you do have a, often a broad ongoing search for the guideline, um, that might be picking up questions outside of the questions currently being looked at in your guideline, and it may identify new questions to look at. And then you can look at the monitoring of media, um, for example, social media or mass media, um, particularly in COVID, this was quite important because this helped us uh, monitor what was really important for the public to know about and for us to produce guidance on um, and produce extra guidance, for example, um, around ivermectin. We've developed some frequently asked questions around that topic because we knew it was quite topical. Uh, so then you look at selecting questions for living mode. So this goes back to some of the key criteria that I mentioned earlier. Um, but you look at first, is the question a high priority for decision making? If it's not, then it is likely to be unsuitable for living mode. Is there uncertainty in the existing evidence base? So again, this question is most likely unsuitable for living mode, but there may be scenarios where, for example, it will go back to the ivermectin um, question, you may actually produce um, some guidance like we did, because even though there was perhaps no longer uncertainty in the existing evidence base, we knew it was such a high priority that we continue to keep this living. Um, then you look at, is there new evidence expected to emerge? Um, and again, the same question, it may still be suitable um, if there's other uh, consumer or policy or contextual issues um, to be looking at. And um, if you answer yes, though, um, which is the traditional model to all three of these questions, um, then you likely have a question that's suitable for living mode. And just to highlight, this is the selection of questions for living within your guideline. So you can have other questions within your guideline that are not in living mode, um, but this is how you select which questions are appropriate to transition to that living guideline model. So um, then you prioritize your questions within living. So we have an initial prioritization. So this is at, at the start, you might say, uh, we're gonna prioritize this to a high priority. We're gonna search daily for this question because we think it's you know, gonna be very frequent um, and we need to really be um, having this one as a key priority. Or perhaps you're prioritizing that to be on a three monthly. So it might be still living, but a lower sort of prioritization level. Then importantly, 
you can look at revising your priority levels throughout the process. So when you look at revising the level, there may be a trigger suddenly, perhaps when you first initially prioritise it, you were aware of an ongoing trial in six months time or something. And then there's a flurry of trials that get published all around the same time. You might revise that from a lower sort of level of prioritisation to being quite a high priority because you know there's lots of emerging evidence coming out um, during uh, that time. And then you might look at retiring the question from living mode. So again, um, take the scenario that suddenly you had all this evidence come out for that particular question. Perhaps then you have um, made a strong recommendation for that particular question. And you may then want to look at retiring that from living because you know that no more evidence coming out or there may be no more evidence at all, or any new evidence that will be published is not going to change the strength of that recommendation, and you've got a high level of certainty there. So, um, sorry, that's uh, as part of the initial prioritisation process, you can look at things like resourcing and funding required as well. Um, so that's particularly important because you can, um, you may only have the capacity to review every three months. <laughs> Um, you may not have the capacity for daily searching, um, even if you thought maybe that would be great. Um, so taking into account some of those considerations about what your, re your resource restrictions are within your guideline. Um, and then you can also conduct um, some ranking exercises. So you can look at a ranking according to both priority and also timing. So as I mentioned before, it might be, we're actually gonna prioritize this for living in 12 months time because that's when we know all the new evidence is gonna be published. And you can do this via formal methods like Delphi processes. Um, so then when you look at revising and retiring the questions, again, it's looking at how often will priority levels be revised. So you can set that criteria throughout your guideline. How often are we actually going to have a look and review whether we need to change our priority levels? What exactly will trigger a priority change? So is that new evidence? Is that it's become you know, quite a topical issue um, in the media? Um, whatever that may be. Um, and how will priority levels be communicated to users? So this goes back to what I was talking about um, in the first presentation, which was, you know, you need to be able to provide an update at, at three monthly to say, this is what we're doing in our guideline. This is the change of priority levels and we've changed it. We've lowered it for this reason or we've you know, made this a higher priority for this reason. And again, the same with how your retired questions will be dealt with. Will they still be identified as part of a broader search or will they be part of, um, you know, are they not going to be searched at all? So just being transparent about what some of those decisions are. So that's it for prioritising questions. So I'll hand back to you, David. Thank you, Saskia. Uh, okay, I will go a bit more into the some of the chapters, and just uh, following this, as I was introducing before, there are overall decisions once you have decided that a given question or a set of questions are going to be leading. Uh, you can you need to decide what is going to be your approach to to the evidence review process. Uh, so we have identified uh, a few approaches. So the default one would be to start a new, a new living systematic review. You have a, a question that is going to be living. Then you start from scratch with a living systematic review. You create your big question and, and you go from there. And that is uh, guidance on how to conduct living systematic reviews from Cochrane, from various authors. So that's a good point to start. Uh, but uh, this could be, we know that living systematic reviews are, are um, hard to maintain. Uh, so there are some other approaches that as a developer you could consider. And one is relying on living systematic reviews that other people are maintaining and developing which is what we call more of an adopting approach. Uh, of course, this had some setbacks. You need to be clear that the peak of questions align with your clinical questions. Uh, that might be sometimes uh, some overlap, but not a perfect overlap with, uh, between your questions and, and the external systematic review uh, that they 
that they are developing. Uh, at the same time, living systematic reviews, you need to be sure that they are uh, good enough and they are updating this living systematic review uh, with uh, enough frequency for you to be useful. Um, then we have also what we call a hybrid approach, which would be taking uh, the novo approach for some of these questions and the adopting approach for some others. Uh, on top of that, uh, you could also use an existing high quality systematic review or a Cochrane review, and then in a way convert it into lead. So you have your baseline review that you know is very good, very strong, that has been published in a given point of in time, and you take the update from them and convert it into a living systematic review. Uh, sorry. Uh, so these are the strengths and limitations of these different approaches. I will not go more into detail. Uh, then uh, once you have this living systematic review and, and you might want to increase or decrease your approach to, to the eligibility criteria and how you, and how you search for, for the evidence. And, and this is something in particular we, we have found in, in COVID-19 and with also some, some of the international collaborations that we, that we establish. Uh, and it is that uh, at some point in time, uh, especially at the beginning when there is more uncertainty, uh, we wanted to have a very broad uh, approach to any study in a given area uh, that was published, we were capturing. So for instance, in our case, uh, we started by capturing not only COVID-19 research, but we looked at other coronaviruses for the initial questions. Uh, of course, once we had uh, enough evidence, um, a specific evidence to COVID-19, and we were aware that these past viral uh, pandemics were not that suitable, we adapted our scope to include only COVID-19 uh, studies. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, you might want to do it the other way around. You might want to have a very narrow, a specific focus at the beginning uh, and then uh, expand it into more indirect evidence. Uh, that might be the case that you uh, wanted to have a very strict and specific criteria for a given clinical question. You go, you do your search, you find your studies and you find that there is not enough evidence, you might, and then you might want to increase a bit your, your, your scope. Uh, of course, this needs to be reported clearly. You need to be very clear on what are your criteria, what are your eligibility criteria, and in case that you do these refinements and changes over time, uh, of course, they need to be reported uh, uh, equally clear. Uh, Search, I will just cover this very briefly. Uh, we have uh, two overall approaches to search that we identified across our different living guideline projects. One is the single overall team search, which is you have a search that covers all uh, publications on a, on a given area. So that's, for instance, some this strategy uh, was followed by the stroke guideline. They have a very broad overarching search that covers all the new stroke publications. And then they have their own triage systems that uh, uh, assigns uh, these publications to specific reviewers. Uh, that helps you be on top of everything that it's published. And, and it helps you monitor and radar all, all, the, all the evidence that is uh, emerging in a given area. Uh, uh, the, second, oh, sorry. the second approach would be to have highly specific searches with a narrow focus. So you have one search for each one of your living questions. Um, and yeah, that would be a bit of a more uh, 
traditional approach to search. Uh, and again, as we were uh, say, as we were defining the criteria for living before, it is important, uh, at least for our guidelines, we are considering that this needs to be conducted at least every three months. Uh, I'm aware of the time, so I will, won't go more in depth into the next chapters, but I invite you to ask any questions or to, or to yeah, just to read the handbook and get back to us if you need any clarification. Uh, we define here a few approaches to uh, evidence appraisal, also on to when and how to update recommendations. Uh, we talk about triggers to incorporation, and I think that's very interesting section to, to look at, because once you have your new evidence, you may want to trigger an update into recommendation, or you may want to wait until there is uh, a certain level of uh, certainty, <laughs> uh, or depending on other considerations as well. So I will stop this here, uh, and we will now go into a small summary of what we have collected so far, and I will let Saskia speak. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, so just to summarise, um, so we've developed this best practice guidance, which has been based on the practical experiences of the Australian Living Evidence Consortium um, in developing living guidelines. So we've got varying intensities of living, um, lots of different experiences there uh, to create this guidance. Um, there's also uh, a series of papers which is going to be coming soon, which provides more in-depth guidance on prioritisation, searching, evidence incorporation and consumer involvement. So we'll let you know um, when those are published if you're interested. Um, and also we have a Smile Journal Club. Um, so this is our uh, Sleek Methods in Living Evidence Journal Club, which we've recently started. So please email us if you're interested in partaking in that. Um, we meet uh, at the moment every two months um, and we welcome anybody to join us and anybody who has ideas of papers they want to discuss um, and share please let us know. Um, we also uh, have the Cochrane Living Evidence Network um, which will be kicking off um, again soon uh, so this was started um, a few years ago um, it's been a bit paused over COVID but uh, now will be rebooted so please if you're interested that's a place to share ideas um, to have more webinars to um, you know, get involved essentially in living evidence methods for anybody who has an interest um, so please email us as well if you'd like to join that um, and we are conducting um, more future work on methods development for living guidelines so please keep checking our handbook because it is a living document. So um, it will be continue to be updated as we develop more guidance and we have more knowledge and experience in the area as we continue developing our living guidelines. So thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Saskia. I, being aware of the time, I want to leave uh, time for questions, but we had a second poll that I will launch now. and. It's just to what do you think, uh, what do you want next from us? What do you think uh, living guidelines community need to address? Uh, so yeah, is if, and also as Saskia mentioned, there are this Smile Club and the Cochrane Living Evidence Network for you to join. So please reach up, reach out to us and we are very happy to invite you. And yeah, uh, and as the poll starts to be answered, yeah, I'm very happy to start taking questions, uh, either you or, or, or me, Saskia. Um, so I'm going to check the chat and see, oh, sorry, if we have any questions. There's a, there's a few questions, David. Maybe, maybe start off with just the, um, the, there's a question about panel members and the turnover in a living model compared to your static model. So any any um anything in the in the handbook or from your experience around how to manage that turnover and ensuring that new people that come on that they get appropriate training and support. Uh, 
Thank you, Gavin. Yeah, um, well, I think it's, um, it's a challenge uh, in terms of that for the moment. Um, we had uh, our, our guideline developer team that, that we train across our living guidelines have mostly stayed with us, uh, but we acknowledge that it, uh, it might not be the case in the future. And especially since living guidelines can be maintained for a, for a long time, uh, that it's something that uh, sooner or later will appear. So we are aware that uh, now some guidelines are very dependent on some people and the expertise that they have developed. Uh, we think that as more people are doing living guidelines and there is more training, more opportunities for people to learn living methods, that, that could be something we, we, we could address. So in, in, in fact, the handbook is part of that, of that uh, as, as we also wanted to use it as a training tool, as a tool for somebody that is joining us and wants to learn about living or how we do things. So, but definitely uh, turnover is, some, uh, especially in teams, it's something we, we need to address and, and to, to solve. Anything you want to add there? Uh, yeah, well, just to add that, I saw a lot of people noted that they're interested in some webinars and training. So we hope that that might solve, um, at least in part, some of those issues. So the more people we have that are aware of living evidence methods that have the training and resources available, it'll be easier to onboard people and kind of account for that turnover. So um, yeah, just we hope that that will keep an eye out for that and please attend. <laughs> Right. Another another question just around the pragmatics and whether the, the handbook goes into much detail around um, the workload and managing just the feasibility of living guidelines. So um, obviously each guideline is slightly different, but is there advice for, from, from your experience around just, just that practicalities, how much time? Often there's not you know, a new publication on every topic every three months. It might be 12 months or nine months, and then you get three all at one time. Um, so just managing that. And related to that was a question uh, that John had around just the ideal size of the teams for each individual um, topic. Um, what's the maximum number of living recommendations, for example, a single team can be working on? Is there any guidance you can provide? Well, I think um, that depends on what your capacity is so I think that's where the prioritization and the revising of the priorities throughout the process really comes in because you might have uh, capacity to have you know five full-time staff or perhaps you only have two full-time staff um, available on your guideline so really thinking okay we have all these questions or perhaps um, I know in this question it's saying that Sometimes, you know, you might have five studies published at once, but you don't have many studies published um, throughout that process. But if you've got other questions that were in living as well, you might suddenly say, well, actually, this is a priority. So you therefore have to deprioritize another question. So that's where the continual sort of revision um, will really help um, with that. So, David, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I just wanted to add that. Um... There is also, it depends very much if you are developing uh, what we call a de novo living guideline or the novel recommendations. That means you don't have any recommendation to begin with and you are starting from, from zero, let's say. Uh, Whether as there is other process or other ways of starting with living and is that you already have an existing guideline and then you move some questions into living. So I think that would also uh, modify very much uh, the, the resources that you need because to start from zero, uh, you will need to climb this initial mountain. And if you need to climb uh, several mountains at the same time, that might be very resource intensive. Uh, whereas if you have an existing guideline that you have updated at some point that you have uh, all your evidence uh, reviewed, then uh, it might need a different amount of control. So, that's something to to consider as well. 
Okay, great. Another question um, from John was just around the prioritization process that you touched on there, Saskia. Um, how systematic is there guidance in the handbook or how systematic is that process and how long does it take? Uh, no, so there's not explicit guidance for how long it takes because I think it really depends again how large your questions are and are you prioritising a whole portfolio of guidelines or are you prioritising just, you know, 10 recommendations that you have within one guideline and you might be, for example, we have uh, some that are doing one recommendation at a time that they're prioritising for living, um, but then I obviously understand if you've got a huge portfolio, like for example at NICE, and you have over 300 guidelines um, with all many recommendations within them um, and you're trying to look at prioritising that, then obviously that's going to take uh, significantly more time um, but we do have um, some more detailed guidance which will be coming out shortly so that's part of that paper um, so that has a number of questions that you can follow so you can look at the considerations um, of you know what might those triggers be how might I think about it and then there's some examples from each of our guidelines um, as part of that as well so we hope that that will help as a sort of uh, checklist that you can follow um, to assist with uh, the prioritisation process. But no, unfortunately, I think it really depends on, on the size of your guidelines and, and what it is and the size of your capacity of your team and how, um, yeah, how you're going to go about that. So. Excellent. Um, another question, and we've got a couple more minutes, but another question was just around that communication piece. So um, whether one part of your guideline might be living and the other's not, but just the way that is, is there advice in the handbook for, for a way to communicate those changes um, so that it's it's clear what has actually changed? Yeah, so right now there, there isn't, but again, that is a chapter that will be coming in the next few months. So we will provide more guidance around um, what you should be communicating, like how regularly, what's been successful for some of, you know, using the experience of some of our guidelines, you know, with open rates of emails and, you know, what you should put as kind of top level information that people want to know when you have a minor update versus a major update and how you alert them um, to that. Uh, so there will be more detailed advice to come. Excellent. Um, question here is, does the living guideline need a living systematic review? Can you have one without the other? Um, I can answer that. I think, uh, I think no. I think you need to rely in some sort of living systematic review process. The question is more if you adapt uh, an existing systematic review and convert it into a living systematic review, or if you um, if you create a, the novel living systematic review. Uh, sorry about the baby, but <laughs> in, Excellent work. yeah. So so yeah, that's that's what I think. You need to rely in some living systematic review because if not, uh, then your update frequency won't be enough to 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 be a, a living a living model. Um, I had a, just a, a question around the transition. So we talked about retiring questions. Um, in your experience, how often does that happen? I know from my experience in, in even the static guidelines is that the, the panels are very reluctant to let topics go. So have we do we have experience with that or, or advice around that process? It's been very limited, as you say. Um, at the moment, it's more been about selecting questions for living and less about retiring. But we are seeing with the COVID guidelines that we are having some questions now start to be retired. So that is something that we're collecting some information on about what decisions were actually made, why were they decided to be retired, what processes were followed to retire those, and hopefully that will inform implementing that across other guideline areas. Yeah, watch this space, I think. Um, now it's one minute to, to 12, so um, I will um, just wrap up. And if you want to move to the, you know, the final slide, if you want to ask any questions of David or Saskia, please do so. Um, the details are there. But from the Australian and New Zealand Guidelines Group, we just want to thank you for your time and the interactions, it's been some great discussions.
hopefully this is, uh, and I think from my unbiased point of view, we do have some world leading work around living evidence here in Australia and that we can be really proud of. So I think we, the more we can share that within this community and learn from each other um, will be really important, but we certainly don't have all the answers yet. And I think that as we learn and do this more, there'll be refinements. Living methodology is just that, it's, it's living. Um, so we appreciate your time and want to thank Saskia and Dave in particular again for that great overview. So, um, we don't have a, an evaluation this time, but as I said, very happy and keen to hear your feedback if there's any. But thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and Merry Christmas. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.